Conversations with Tyler is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, bridging the gap between academic ideas and real-world problems. Learn more at mercatus.org. And for more conversations, including videos, transcripts, and upcoming dates, visit conversationswithtyler.com. I thought we would start with Matt Levine's greatest hits, and then Matt, having been a classics major, we'd move on to the Latin classics and maybe tie the two together a bit. (laughs) So just to think about derivatives markets, you've worked in that sector. By some measures, derivatives are over a quadrillion in value, outstanding. But there's another way you can measure the net positions and turn it into zero. So what's the right way to think about how large derivative markets are and what's the risk associated with that size? The right way to think about it is in the you know the way that that you would do it at a at a you know if you were actually working in the derivatives market is to sort of think about the like the risk exposures of it so like if you have a you know if you have an interest rate swap the right way to think about it is the the d v o one or or you know like the right way to think about a equity swap is like the delta of it so you know, often you see these quadrillion dollar numbers, they're like, you know, they're a quadrillion dollar notional of like, you know, short term interest rate swaps where like the idea that you could lose a quadrillion dollars on it is, <laughs> is quite low. Is, you know, the risk of that is quite low. <clears throat> the systemic question, I don't know the answer to, right? I mean, like how risky are derivatives in general is I think a sort of, you know, there's a, there's a time when it was derivatives are weapons of mass destruction. And I think obviously there's like a sense in which that came true, but like, you know, I worked in equity derivatives and like, you know, total return swaps didn't like blow up the world. Right. I mean, it's like a specific set of exposures to specific risks were bad and were perhaps magnified by the ability to make zero sum bets on them. But the idea that like the notion of derivatives is somehow like itself a risk factor was never super compelling to me. And there's a certain centralization of risk with derivatives. So you put a lot of risk into a clearinghouse. Maybe you can bail out the clearinghouse if you have to more efficiently than individual investors, but that also increases moral hazard. At the margin, do you think we've centralized derivatives risk too much or too little? I think we're still sort of in, you know, we're like a little bit in early phases of doing it, but like, I think we've, you know, I'm, I'm among those who are a little skeptical of the notion of centralizing derivatives risk into clearinghouse, right? Like it seems to me that a clearinghouse has more moral hazard than a, than a bank, right? Like a clearinghouse is, is often a sort of like, you know, a member association where like you're ultimately relying on the members for your capitalization and for your, uh, for your protection against blowing up. Whereas like a bank, like, you know, if you're on a desk, like you're like, Obviously, banks have a lot of moral hazard, and like the sort of notion that banks have moral hazard is 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 a lesson that has been learned and probably overlearned from the financial mm-hmm. crisis. But like you know, like if you're on a desk, like you don't want to lose a lot of money. If you're a clearinghouse, like your concerns about losing a lot of money are are, are a little a little more attenuated. I think. Does your experience with derivatives make you feel better or worse about crypto kitties being priced at one hundred and seventeen thousand k per pop? Uh, are they just a derivative? Crypto, I don't really. Is a crypto kitty a derivative on ether? In the sort of, <laughs> you know, in the in is the, there a fact of the matter? Yeah, I mean, like, sure, like in the, in the naive sense of like, did it come from ether? Sure, like I think that like all those markets are so immature, right? Like I think of of like derivatives markets as being a sort of like mark of of maturity and of, of like the ability to sort of like understand what exposures exist in some instrument or in some like economic reality, and then say, well, we're gonna ha- we're gonna pick these exposures and hedge them out and we're going to pick these exposures and magnify them and we're going to have a the ability to kind of like fine tune all of our exposures because we've like been doing this for a long time we've been trading currencies or equities or whatever for a long time you know like there's like the beginning of like a thing that you could call a derivatives market in cryptocurrency but it's not it's not that right it's it's like the opposite of that right it's like no one no one knows what like ether is in a sense and so like the idea that you're fine tuning your exposures to it is just not Crypto kitties are the opposite of that. They're like making your exposures weirder and more complicated. (laughs) We have a good idea of how to price most futures and options. But when it comes to pricing, say, Bitcoin or other crypto assets, what do you think is the best model we have, however bad they may all be, for thinking about what that value should be? I actually think it's you've you've said it, which is which is like there's some like a pool of world financial wealth. And then there's you pick a random small number 
and you say that percentage of world financial wealth should be Bitcoin, right? So like people used to, and I was like sort of persuaded by the notion that you could use like a currency model and say, well, you know, like the, the amount of transactions that you do with Bitcoin is this and the velocity of is that. And so this is the total value of Bitcoin there should be. But I'm no longer persuaded by that because I don't think that Bitcoin is particularly, I don't think that people's claims for Bitcoin now are that it's, that it's a currency, right? They're, they're, that it's a store of value. And it's a store of value that isn't like tethered to anything else. And so it's just a question of like how much, you know, there's some percentage of people's wealth is in gold. Like, well, if they'd shifted half of that to Bitcoin, Bitcoin would be worth X. That I think is the bad, but best available model. I think there are other cryptocurrencies. You could imagine a currency model where you say, well, you know, how many, how much file storage, how big is the file storage market? And then what would the velocity of a file coin be? But I'm not sure that you could answer that because I think that like the the intuitions that you'd have around velocity of money are not necessarily the right intuitions for velocity of like a token that you use to spend on files. And how well Bitcoin does as a hedge or store of value relative to gold? I mean, what variables do you think of when you try to figure that out? You're trying to project 10, 20 years in the future, crypto assets competing against gold, or maybe even stores of art, fine art as held in warehouses. What does that depend upon? Is it transactions uses? Do they matter at all anymore? Will the dominant crypto asset be one that people also use to buy things? Or will those two functions be totally separate? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I was, I was talking to someone today who, who argued that if Bitcoin hadn't been invented and if the, the white paper had been, or if the white paper had been out there, but if people hadn't started using Bitcoin, what would happen, would have, what would have made more sense to happen first would be the useful, the utility tokens would come first because you can explain, well, you know, you use Filecoin to buy file storage or you use whatever to buy whatever. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's just, you can use it to buy anything, but there's no, there's no tethered store of value to it. And you could imagine a world where like all the ICOs work and where, all of the coins that you use to buy useful things work. And then Bitcoin is, is less, you know, doesn't have, because it doesn't have a sort of obvious utility value, loses value. But I don't know. I don't buy that. I think that like, I think that people's desire to use a hundred different currencies to do a hundred different activities is probably overrated by the crypto community. And I think that like Bitcoin's first mover advantage and, uh, and popular fame is, has the potential to entrench it. I mean, to answer your first question, like I have no idea what variables you'd look at, but I think it's if Bitcoin stays above, you know, X thousand dollars for a year, then that just increases its likelihood of staying above X thousand dollars for another year. And eventually it just, you know, by force of repetition becomes a store of value. Since almost every store issues gift certificates, and this seems to be a profitable activity, can we not imagine a future where almost every business issues cryptocurrency in some form. Maybe the velocity or a volume will be low, but there'll be a cryptocurrency for every business and an ICO, just like now we have gift certificates. And this is perfectly fine. We shouldn't think it's weird. The real question is, why not more crypto kitties? I've never heard of a crypto doggy. I've never heard of a crypto turtle, right? Yes, no? No, no store. <laughs> you want a crypto doggy? No store like quintuples its market value by issuing gift certificates, right? I mean, like the reason, like the, the the crypto frenzy is not. If this were a story of gift certificates, I think it would it would be a lot less interesting. I mean, if you say, oh, look, you know, it's true that people don't want hundred currencies, but they use gift certificates, which is not. I don't know how much people use those gift certificates every day, but like <laughs> if you're if if that's the story, then I, I suppose it's true. But that's not. That's a sad outcome for like a let a thousand cryptocurrencies bloom if it's if it's just you know Starbucks accepts Starbucks tokens. Would you rather I give you a Ponzi coin or a banana coin? A banana coin being connected to an organic bananas blockchain drawing upon banana supply in Laos. I think I would take the well, I'm tempted to say like if I'm answer like I'm tempted to say I would take the Ponzi coin because I suspect that neither I think that they're probably equally connected to like a viable blockchain in Laos <laughs> and at least the Ponzi coin like says it on the tin. But I want to be careful with that because, like the you know the, the the reason I take either of them is to resell them, and like clearly the like the the uh, the frenzy of saying that you have a utility, saying that there's a blockchain somewhere, probably does increase the resale value in the extremely short term in which I'd be holding these coins. We're in New York. We have Uber. We have taxis. They compete against each other. There at least appears to be a long history of the taxi sector being somewhat of a natural monopoly. What's the final equilibrium? in New York City and elsewhere, 
And does the company Uber have positive value? Given that right now it's losing money per ride, right? Chinese investors are subsidizing us at the margin. If the price goes up, I would prefer to shift back to taxis. How do you think about that market? As a consumer, you know, I really like Uber. And I think that uh, <laughs> Uber addressed some technological failings in the ta- just in terms of like being, being able to hail Ubers without, you know, going out on the street and waiting for them and being able to hail them around the world rather than, you know, like hailing taxes in New York is nice, but it's nice to have an app on your phone where you can do it wherever you go. Um, so as a consumer, I'm a big fan of Uber. And I think that, you know, our tax is a natural monopoly. I mean, there's certainly a, 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 a seeker of regulatory rents in New York that, you know, it is, it is I, I, to some extent by Uber's rhetoric about kind of, you know, breaking down. There, there's clearly some, some taxi protective regulation that is not pro consumer. And to the extent Uber is fighting against that, you know, they make a good case for their flagrant disregard for the law. Um, you know, and the, and the, the big question is they continue to be subsidized by investors and what is the long-term outcome of that? And I don't know. I think that probably, I mean, presu- like their bet is that the long-term outcome of that is self-driving cars and that they have some sort of advantage in being the provider of the self-driving car app, which I'm not sure if that is super compelling because it seems to me it's hard to build a self-driving car. It's relatively easy to build a routing app to send the self-driving car to you. And so if Tesla or Apple or whoever build the best self-driving car, I'll just download Tesla's app. So it's a risk for Uber, but like, you know, as a, as a strategy bootstrapping by getting a $70 billion market cap and then spending a lot of money to be the leader in self-driving cars. It's not a crazy strategy, right? I mean, they built from an app to being a $70 billion company. So the the so-called moat for the company, it starts with the app, but over time it shifts to owning a fleet of self-driving cars? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, it doesn't seem like a routing app is that great a moat. Let me ask you a very Matt Levine. It's not bad, right? Because it's a network effect sure. you know, like around the world, but it's not a but the network of drivers, they'll work for Lyft and Uber. That doesn't seem like much of a moat. Consumers will stick with Uber insofar as they're happy, but they're probably not intrinsically that loyal to Uber. Yeah, you need someone else to get significant name recognition. So like if, you know, Apple builds a self-driving car and Apple, you know, Apple builds a driving app or a, a ride hailing app, then it can take on Uber pretty quickly. I think if, uh, you know, if, if, if some random interloper comes, it's harder. But, yeah. Let me ask you a very Matt Levine question. Yeah. Are you worried that people aren't worried enough? So if we look at markets and security prices, there are plenty of signs that volatility has been quite low. By some measures, it hasn't been this low for 50 years. The world seems slightly unusual. Not only the crypto kitties, there are other strange features of our country and world. And is this decline in volatility, is it driven by investors getting smarter, by more ETFs, fewer shares out there to trade, by more indexing? foreign investors with nowhere else to go? What's your best hypothesis? As a general background answer to that, I'm like such a, like in my personal life, I'm such an efficient markets guy. Like like the answer to the question, are you worried that people aren't worried enough about anything is like I'm not because because I sort of like assume that there is like a giant pool of people who are smarter than I am and they're coming to a reasonable conclusion. They're Um, reading you, of course, and thinking, what does Matt Levine say? But so like, you know, in general, if, if, People are like, our stock price is too high as well as, you know, the VIX too low. I'm like, ah, oh, if it was too high, it'd be lower, right? But so, um, <laughs> and the volatility thing, I mean, look, it's, it's a thing that I find incredibly weird because I think like you, I find the world right now incredibly weird and, and, you know, one wants to explain it and I don't know the right explanation. The explanation that I sort of like is that the prices of financial assets have somewhat decoupled from human emotion about the world that is not financial assets. And, you know, why would that be? You know, I would love it to be a story. And I think there's probably some argument for it to be a story of markets have become more technological. We've, you know, there's famously markets, stock prices overreacted to news as measured by subsequent dividend changes, you know, forever. And, you know, eventually that's an anomaly that someone will exploit, right? Eventually you'll build a thing that reacts directly to news. I think that there are, I don't think that's a wholly compelling thesis. I think that what I'd like the story to be is that financial markets have gotten smarter and they they react less to news. And so even though the news is noisier, 
they react less to that noisy news because it turns out not to affect asset prices in as noisy a way as you'd think by just watching TV. I think that there is something to, compelling to that because we actually have seen smart people build smart things that do a good job of you know, making investing decisions. And so you'd sort of expect over time, as people build more rational investing tools, investing would become more rational. The good counter argument to that is that investing is not a sort of technological problem in the world that can be solved. It's a interpersonal fight. It's a, you know, trading in particular is a, is a sort of attempt to, to be better than someone else. And so you can never make trading more rational because as you get better, you know, someone else gets better and like you're, you know, the residue will ultimately still be your sort of human biases. But I don't know, I'm, I'm biased towards the view that, that we have gotten, gotten smarter at kind of decoupling our emotional reactions to the news from financial asset prices. And part of that is just like, whether or not that's true globally, there's like a local sense in which like, you know, like the first day of like Trump's election, everyone panicked. And then he said another crazy thing. And then he said another, and like, there's just like, eventually you tune it out. Right. And that's a form of this thing of like reacting less to, uh, of financial assets reacting less to, to sort of human reactions to the news. There are three sets of market prices that, that bug me. One is Bitcoin and other crypto assets. True. Another is all the negative real yields on government securities and sometimes even negative nominal yields. And then there's blue chip stocks being so high. Could it be those three are part of the same general phenomenon, namely that good stores of value are relatively scarce compared to growing global wealth and that money flows to each of those that has nowhere else to go. They all look high. They're going to stay high. It's a sign of our paucity of insurance markets and other ways of protecting wealth. And in some ways, it's a pessimistic sign. So the price can be permanently high and we should be worried about our own inability to deal with risk. Yes or no? Sure. I mean, you know, like the, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of like transmuted story of the financial crisis of like the supply of low risk assets was insufficient to meet the demand. And so people built things that were low risk financial assets that turned out to be risky, right? I mean, now it's a Bitcoin can replace CDOs, maybe like there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a lot of money chasing assets that are good stores of value. Investors who index, again, a Matt Levine question. First, how worried are you about the spread of indexing? But also, if you think of indexing as somewhat endogenous, so if more market research is needed, you would expect fewer people to index because there's a higher return to learning something. So the flow of funds in and out of indexing, how rational or efficient a process do you think that is at the end of the day? And as we move more and more to indexing, how will this affect securities markets? Please address any combination of those you care to. So so the, the thing that I like is that, uh, you know, U.S. public markets – the companies that are in you, there are fewer companies, they're older, they're, they're bigger, they're more profitable. And so that's, that's a sort of interesting fact about like the composition of markets. And one sort of straightforward thing to take away from that is that in a world like that, it makes sense to index more, right? In a world where you can't find the next Facebook in public markets, in a world where like all companies are kind of the same, they're kind of, you know, they're established, they're profitable, like the, the spread between companies is sort of narrower, the returns to the stock picking are going to be a little lower and, it, and it's more rational to index. And then like the next question is like, which side of it is causal? And I think that there's probably some story you could tell about the rise of indexing and the sort of focus on cost and in investing generally leading to a real focus on scale and in investing. And when investment funds are trying to operate at enormous scale, the attractiveness of a $100 million IPO is lower, the attractiveness of like a weird company that doesn't fit into the index is lower. And so you have the rise of indexing driving the sort of phenomenon of companies of there being fewer and larger and more profitable public companies. And so you have a, you have a feedback loop in that sense. I feel like I've traveled away a little from your question. but um, Some activities are what we might call nerdy, and others are not. So country and Western music is not very nerdy. There are plenty of bars, say in lower Manhattan, that are not very nerdy. Uh, finance has become pretty nerdy. What makes an activity nerdy? Has finance become pretty nerdy? I don't know. <laughs> like, so I think that what makes an activity nerdy, like I think there are two like sort of, you know, clusters of factors. One is having some sort of academic, like, 
barrier, right? Where right. Like, you have to be smart to do it or you have to learn something to do it, right? And the other traditionally is unpopularity, right? Like you're a nerd because you're not cool. Right. Um, I think that like the like what's happened with finance, like finance in the last, you know, N years has become nerdier in the academic sense, right? Like it's just, you know, the the threshold to be hired at a you know on a trading floor, you know, in like the days of of uh of liar's poker was like, you know, you needed to like, you know, be like a fun guy to hang out with and maybe have gone to high school, right? And like in and now it's like you need a PhD in <laughs> physics, right? And so um and so like like in that sense it's become nerdier. But like there's also like I think of tech as be, having, be, uh, you know, computer programming when I was like a kid was quite nerdy because it was academic, but also people are like, why are you doing that? Like go play sports. Right. Whereas now I think computer, you know, you see enough like Mark Zuckerberg stories and it's like computer programming is like the way to become a billionaire who like controls the world's not just like, you know, it's not just power, but like controls the world's like social relationships and finances like that weird point where like, you know, in New York, if you like go out to the club, like there are a lot of finance people there, right? It's like, it doesn't have like quite the nerdy, the sort of like pure nerdiness component. I and think. Ha- has finance become less unpopular just because of passage of time since the crisis? Or is it in part because tech is now so unpopular with the media and some intellectuals that it's taken over that pride of place and finance is pushed to the side and we can be ignored a bit, maybe like highly skilled carpenters, but nerdier. I think there's, there is some of that. I was sort of like taking a broader view of your question. I think finance was like unpopular in the sense of just sort of like niche. And then it became extremely central to the world in like 2005. And then it became extremely unpopular. And I think extremely unpopular is almost as good as popular in terms of like not being nerdy, right? If you're a, if you're a villain, <laughs> you're not a nerd, right? But no, I think there is some of that, like, you know, the world, the world is, you know, I say memories are short in finance, but it's actually been 10 years since the crisis. Like the world, you know, there's, there's some reason for the world to have found new things to be interested in. Here's a question from a reader, and I quote, Are there huge bets being made on Wall Street now that could end in something like the CDO MBS financial crisis debacle? Maybe that I don't know about. I think that, like my general impression is that like the reform of financial regulation since the financial crisis has had a lot of its intended effects. And one of those is that systemically important financial institutions, by some reasonable definition, probably aren't making huge directional bets on things, like huge levered directional bets on things that aren't sort of traditional banking products mm-hmm. anyway. So, you know, I'd, you never know, right, like what someone's getting up to, but like, I'd be surprised if like there are huge levered directional bets existing at regulated financial institutions. Do you have um, a single biggest worry? However tiny, tiny, tiny it may be? I don't think I do. I mean, I don't think I do. Like I the thing that I find weirdest is the lack of volatility in the face of a very strange and volatile world, but I've reconciled myself to that. So if you were running the division of But this is this is my like efficient markets like optimism where like I just, you know, I just I assume that if someone if something bad was happening, it would happen. But efficient markets is also pessimism, right? It's harder to make the world better than it already is because you can't see past what others are seeing very easily. Sure, it's an efficient markets like conservatism or something. Right. Yeah. If you're running the division of enforcement at the SEC right now, what would you be telling your people to concentrate on? Well, like ICO frauds, like is the simply. Like, but hard. they're all informed investors, right? Grandmas in this country are not buying ICO so much, let them lose their money to each other or not? You know, I just have an aesthetic objection to, to <laughs> ICO. No, it, you know, yeah. I mean, like, I think if you're the division of enforcement at the SEC, like your number one priority is protecting uninformed retail investors fr- from, well, very high on your list is protecting uninformed retail investors from fraud. Also pretty high on your list is protecting dumb retail investors from egregious frauds that undermine that just like that just make you look bad you know like there's a sort of like you don't like you don't really want to be the country where people are committing fraud and you know running pump and dump groups and talking about it and having articles written about it and high-fiving each other it doesn't seem to like 
encouraged confidence in the markets. I mean, the other thing that like, it, you know, as, as the SEC division of enforcement, you might consider is like larger, more systemic things than retail fraud. And I've gone back and forth on this. Like, I think that the grandmas losing their pensions to boiler room operators in Florida, like is a very clear harm. I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in among regulators in like the people lying to their customers about large structured credit trades because those are bigger trades and you can like get bigger penalties because they're you're defrauding a bank or whatever and i think that like you know you have to weigh like the bigness of the potential harm and like the the just the sort of overall size of the transaction with like how morally and aesthetically abhorrent the transactions are and i think that like the person defrauding the grandma in the in the boiler room is like very clearly doing something wrong. I think there's a lot of gray area behavior in like institutional bond markets that have like, that has gotten a lot of focus because it is gray area. So it's more interesting to bring a case if you're an enforcement, you know, if you're a prosecutor or an enforcer and it's institutional. So it's just sort of a sexier thing to deal with and like retail fraud in Florida. But in some ways it's less bang for your buck because you are kind of just like tweaking the rules in a, in a market that is that is essentially among informed investors who can kind of take care of themselves. Now, like you, I'm mostly an efficient markets guy, but I, when I look at initial public offerings, I'm very baffled because investment banks take such a huge cut. If you needed to argue, well, they need the cut because they talk up the security and in the absence of their efforts, no one would be interested and it's worth it. Maybe that argument works, but it seems somewhat to stand in tension with an efficient markets hypothesis which suggests the thing will find its appropriate level without any particular investor having to talk it up. And furthermore, attempts to get around the current mainstream system of IPOs have not always been successful. Auctions have been tried. Israel has tried other methods. Spotify is giving it a go. We'll, we'll get further data, but they're not obviously doing better. But how do you reconcile IPOs in their current form continuing, the investment banks taking such a huge cut, and some version of efficient markets hypothesis actually making sense. Do you see what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, how do I reconcile? Um, one version of efficient markets is that in the absence of news, the price yesterday is going to be the price today or whatever. Right? Like, there's some sort of like continuity of prices. And the IPO is a huge discontinuity, right? I mean, like you don't have a price and then you have a price. And so you'd sort of like, if your notion of efficient markets is like a sort of straight line of like the price not moving very much or like of the price, you know, sort of instantly incorporating information, you sort of, it's not unintuitive that you'd have a big squiggle at the start, right? Like that you wouldn't really know what the price is for three days and then you would. Um, and so that's like, like, I don't think it's unusual that like the first trade of a stock would not be the price that it settles to in a week, but then the second week would be pretty close to the first. But that week. the direction is so predictable, though, that's odd. The pop, right? The direction is so, so there's, sure, but that's like, like what's happening, like one thing that's happening is that the banks are doing the thing that create that like they're doing the work they're getting paid for, which is going out to a bunch of buyers and talking about the stock and sort of trying to, to generate a price. And that work is, is like sort of non-efficient markets work, right? It's like M&A work where it's like, you know, there's no like sort of visible price and you're sort of negotiating you know, one off with big investors. And then once they have that price, they sell it for less. I mean, that's not really true, but like that's kind of like intuitively what's happening is that once they have that price, they sell it for less for a variety of reasons, right? Like you're like, the stories for it are, I think somewhat compelling, right? I mean, it's like you sell... You, you want a pop because you want the early investors to be rewarded for taking a leap of faith in the company. And that's like maybe a little silly in like a, you know, a giant IPO, but like it's not that silly in like a tiny IPO where there's like some hair on it and where it's a small company and you have to give someone some ex expectation of returns to get interested. And yeah, I mean, I think the, that work before the pop, that figuring out what the thing is worth and, worth and selling it to investors and doing research and everything, that's like what the banks are getting paid for, right? Like the pop is not the same thing as the bank's fee, right? The mm -hmm. bank is like doing work to try to get to a reasonable price and then they're selling it for 15% less than that price. The other, thing, the other thing about the pop is that investors in the IPO have an interest in the stock going up. The sellers in the IPO have no interest in the stock going down, right? It's bad for them. It's bad for them for... A variety of reasons, the main one being that they are keeping most of the stock and they don't want the stock to go down. And so 
when you have that set of dynamics, no one is sad when the stock goes up. Everyone's sad if the stock goes down. Like, why would you overprice it? Now, Matt speaks Latin, and he was a classics major as an undergraduate at Harvard. I don't really and speak Latin. You once told me that law was easier than classics. What did you mean by that? I mean, they're both like sort of, you know, like the activity that you do in your academic job as an undergraduate or law student is like sort of sitting around analyzing dense texts. But like in law, they're mostly in English, right? So like that's a big, it's just very straightforward. Like if you're you're not raised speaking ancient Greek, it is much easier to read even like a 19th century legal decision than to read, you know, Thucydides. I don't know. I mean, like law is so, it's so just like embedded in our society, you know, like sort of like, you know, you grow up watching, you know, law and order or whatever, right? Like there's a sort of like, it is like, it is very much part of like the fabric of how we live. Whereas, you know, reading Greek poetry when I was in college was an extremely niche activity. And so required a little bit more investment to just kind of like come up to any familiarity with it. Now, I brought my copy of Horace's Epistles sure. to this conversation. It's, just, it's been terrifying me all day. <laughs> and I actually think of a lot of your Bloomberg writings as being a kind of modernized Horace. So you read Horace, there's a preoccupation with wealth, with law. There's a humor in it, the way he segues from one topic to another. There are even mixed feelings on how the pursuit of wealth would translate into happiness. The length of a lot of Horace's letters is actually about the same <laughs> as the length of some of your Bloomberg columns. So there's a little quiz here. I'm going to read a few sentences, and you need to tell me, were they written by Horace, or were they written by Matt Levine? This had better be easy. This is, are you going to read them in Latin? Or? In English. Here's the first one, quote, I store up and organize material so that I may be able to draw upon it before long. Horace or Matt? I'm going to say Horace. That's Horace, very good, from the Ars Poetica. And he's trying to tell you he doesn't speak Latin. That was in English. That was in English. <laughs> what is to prevent one from telling the truth as he laughs? The Horace? Horace. Okay, yes. very good. Two for two. No, you're done. Here's another quote. Football player derivatives are the best derivatives. <laughs> Horace? <laughs> Three for three. <laughs> and finally, quote, in laboring to be concise, I become obscure. Wow. I mean, Horace, but, <laughs> but thumbs up Horace. Thumbs um, up Horace. <laughs> the other, like, I, I feel like, um, I feel like when you, you know, when you're, when you're like an undergraduate classics major, you read, um, you read like Horace and Catullus are sort of paired with each other. And Hor and Catullus is the like sort of like hot-headed young romantic who wrote sort of like quasi-pornographic uh, love poems. And Horace is the like sort of older, wiser, like, you know, backed away from the world. You know, like the, the famous Horace love poems are are sort of more cynical and more um, at a remove from the world. And that's something I also admire and attempt to emulate in my own in my own work to be like a little, like I'm probably like, you know, I, I tell people I'm an opinion columnist and I don't have any opinions. I try to be a little less, like a little more removed from the, like the passionate engagement. As is often the case in some of the Latin classics. Oh yeah. Now what's the best thing you've read or reread in Latin in the last five years? <sighs> I don't read a lot of Latin in the last five years. <laughs> I mean, the answer honestly is, is, uh, is, um, and, and and the answer is because I don't read a lot is, is Horace Odes 1-5 is the sort of famous uh, it's Chris Multa Gracilis tape or in Rosa. It's the sort of most famous world-weary renunciatory Horatian love poem. It's good stuff. What do Latin speakers and readers get about ancient Rome that non-Latin speakers miss? I don't have like a substantive answer. What, I, what you get is like a sort of sense of like what I took from my, from like a classical education is like this like sense of like direct engagement with like humans who lived 2000 years ago, right. Of like a, like a being able to like Cicero's letters are like a sort of classic piece of Latin literature. Cause Cicero is this like sort of like famous, like stern orator who like, you know, wrote these very serious law court speeches, but then he also has a lot of letters that have come down to us. And there, some of them are sort of like for publicity and some of them are much more personal, but like they're all 
least ostensibly personal. And like, you get the sense of like this actual human who's this like sort of famous figure and this famous lawmaker, but like you experience his consciousness more directly in his language. And that to me was like, just sort of like the weird and interesting part of being a classics major was just like being able to sit with people from 2000 years ago and, and see how many of their concerns are similar and see how many of their concerns are so different and so weird in a, in a pretty direct way. Now, as you, Matt, know, in every conversation with Tyler, there's a middle segment called underrated versus overrated. I toss something out. You tell me if it's underrated or overrated. You're always free to pass, of course. And the first one is writing in legalese. Underrated or overrated? You know, under, like, I mean, it's not great, but like underrated, I would say. Like, I think that like in general people, like, I don't know what that means, but like in general people are like too quick to, to, to criticize jargon and legalese and all these things, right? I mean, like, there's often a set of technical meanings that are just easier and more efficient to use when you're using the jargon of a field. And I think aesthetic criticisms of legalese are, are often overblown. Um, that said, I've read some really bad like legal writing and like some mixed feelings, but like that's I under. Legal realism, overrated or underrated? It's, it feels like it's gone from the academy and it's gone from, you know, it's, not something that people talk about in daily life. And I, you know, to me, it explains everything. So I'd say under. <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh my God, underrated. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, like highly rated, but like, um, but comparative, like among the most important American cultural products and not rated that way. <laughs> what makes it special? What makes it, it's, you know, like part of it is like, you know, it, it, you go back and watch it and it's not as good as you think because like it has had such an influence on later things that, that it, like the it's it's shockingness has been attenuated. Um, so part of it is just its influence on on subsequent television. But it's it's like it's a it's a perfect example of dealing very intelligently with serious themes in a way that, on its surface and particularly in its title, is silly, right? And so and, and is and is is not presented as serious, which I think is obviously something that I often aspire to do but i also think it's just something that like the internet aspires to do like i think a lot of like just sort of like modern internet culture has that sort of vein of like using colloquial language and being casual but like you know attempting to address more serious issues and i think you know buffy didn't invent that but buffy is such a like um is a, is a cultural touchstone for some of that approach hearkening back to the romans virgil's magnum opus the aenid overrated yeah sure overrated i you know i um i've i told you i you know when i was in college i did a, a summer program in rome run by father reginald foster who's the who was the latin secretary to the pope and he does this he's a carmelite friar from wisconsin and he would have a program for whoever wants to come would come and read and speak latin and uh we read some gorgeous passage of ovid and he concluded and he said isn't that nice? Isn't that better than Virgil? Virgil is gray and wicked. <laughs> it's Virgil. Yeah, he's a, he's, I was always biased against Virgil after that, but he's, you know, <laughs> so this is not true, but like he's a propagandist and he's sort of like a, you know, I don't know. It's overrated. What's the most underrated neighborhood of New York City? I was saying, I don't, I don't have an answer to that because I, I've only lived in extremely highly rated neighborhoods. I, I, live in, <laughs> I live in Park Slope now, which some magazine a few years ago declared the best neighborhood in America, which like it would be hard it to argue. It may be that better yet. Um, I don't know other, other like Park Slope adjacent neighbor like Gowanus maybe I'd say Gowanus is underrated it's like a great like food destination it's like got great like uh, like industrial chic architecture sorry Gowanus footnotes overrated or underrated underrated but like fairly rated now I don't know people people have come around on footnotes a lot of footnotes started in medieval times as commentary on the Latin classics of course including Horace Sure. I mean, right. I, like the, the, you know, the, the notion of like a sort of like, like intertextuality or like, you know, like, like a, having multiple lines of the text, like having a main line and having asides is a sort of valuable notion. And one that I think has been like kind of valorized by internet writing in a way, right? Like, I think it's just easier to you have links, you have, you know, you can, the notion of having like a single narrative with no distractions and having that be the sort of like highest achievement of writing is I think a little 
diminished by the internet and and therefore footnotes have become more appropriately valued. What financial stories or issues do you think are not getting enough coverage and why? It's hard for me to answer questions like that because I'm such a creature of coverage. <laughs> like I wake up and I read the news and I write <laughs> about it. So I rarely take a step back. But um I don't know. I like the thing that I would like to read and hear more about is I came to this from a bank and I think banks are interesting objects. Like banks and hedge funds are not like perfect substitutes for each other. Like banks do something interesting. And there's a lot about it, but I would I'd be interested in seeing more because I don't feel like I have a good answer on like what will happen to banks. Like what, you know, we're in the early days of it seems to be pretty wholesale financial deregulation. And obviously banks in 2006 were different places from what they are now. And one possibility is they'll go back to doing exactly what they did in 2006, right? Another possibility is they'll do, go back to doing something precisely analogous to that, but in totally different instruments and ways and whatever, but like will be similarly freewheeling, fascinating, dangerous places. Another possibility is that like something like a switch has been effectively flipped in the culture and they won't go back. And I just don't know. And I'd love to see, like, I think that banks have become very boring. I think like the coverage of like what banks are doing to be more interesting is kind of like, you know, things have moved on to like more interesting places. You know, there's a million articles about Bitcoin and it's possible that banks will be becoming more interesting. And I, I don't have a handle on, on the ways in which they're doing that. Bloomberg aside, who would you say is underfollowed as a writer? Not counting our colleagues. I always want to pass on these. Like, I just like forget people. <laughs> Ovid once wrote, in our leisure, we reveal what kind of people we are. Do you agree? I guess. Yeah, sure. I mean, right. I, in my leisure, I, I read the internet and do crossword puzzles and <laughs> hang out with my daughter. <laughs> I'm pretty boring in my leisure, which is probably accurate. You once wrote, I think this was a speculation rather than a definitive pronouncement, but you wrote... Everything is. I think more and more <laughs> about how all of Western culture is a footnote to Iliad Book 9. What did you mean? I have a sort of idiosyncratic take on... on Book nine of the Iliad. You know, the Iliad is the story of like Achilles is is the great warrior in the on the Greek side in the Trojan War, and he gets mad at some slight and he goes back to his tent to sulk, and the Greeks start losing. And so then they send emissaries to his tent to say, Please come back. And he says no. And then the Greeks start losing some more, and he eventually comes back and he gets killed. And that's basically the story of the Iliad. And in book nine is the, is the, where they send the emissaries to say, please come back. And he says, no. And, and he gives this speech, this response that is weird where he says, you know, effectively the prophecy is that if I go back to fight here, I will die here and my name will be immortal. And if I go home, I you know, don't go back to fight. I'll go home and live a long life and will be forgotten. And he chooses to go back and be forgotten. And then later he changes his mind because his friend gets killed. And this like crux point of the Iliad is this like really existential almost like examination of like, like, you know, this, this Greek warrior in this heroic culture that, uh, that, you know, like clearly valorizes like heroism and deathless fame and everything. And who is like the, you know, canonically the most famous heroic warrior and the one with the most deathless fame. He's the one who says, he says, nah, I'd rather go back and live a long life on my farm. And, you know, the, the, the forcing of that choice is like the central point of like the, the highest work of Greek art prefigures a lot of like existentialist and sort of like thought in the future, I think. What makes Nabokov's Pinin an interesting novel? <laughs> I've been reading my secret tumble, <laughs> um, which I will not put a link up to. It's just very like Nabokovian. It's just like a bunch of, you know, he's just this great like esthete of like, of like sort of almost pointless pleasure in writing. And so there's this, there's this scene that I love where Pneen, the like um, absent minded professor character, is like heartbroken after a run in with his, uh, with his ex wife. And he's like dejectedly walking through the park on the way home and he's pondering the meaning of life. And Nabokov says something like, and he's about, he's, almost come upon a sort of solution to one of the great mysteries of life. And then he's interrupted by a squirrel who runs up on a water fountain and demands that he help the squirrel drink from the water fountain. And like, and so he helps the squirrel and then he moves on. And so it's just like sort of random interlude of just gorgeous writing and bizarre scenery and just sort of like 
random pile up of weird delightfulness with no point that I find very appealing. If we think about mergers and acquisitions, one of the standard results in the empirical finance literature is that acquiring firms do fairly poorly. That is, acquisitions don't seem to pay off. Yet, of course, acquisitions persist, and you've done M&A work in your life. How do you think about this process? If it doesn't pay off, is it about empire building? Is it about winner's curse? Do you somehow not trust the data? You would challenge the interpretation of the result? Or how good are acquisitions for the acquiring firm, and what goes wrong? So I wouldn't challenge the data. I mean, like, to, to me, like... It's, a, it's, a, it's like a similar story to, to active management in some ways, right? Like the fact that M&A is bad doesn't mean that your merger will be bad, right? And so like there's a sort of, so one, there's like obviously a bias towards empire building, right? And then two, you can, you, you don't, you, you don't say that, right? You're not, you're not like, well, I'd like to have a bigger company to run. What you say is this merger will be good and you believe it, right? And, and like the data is not overwhelming that all mergers are sure. bad, right? The data is like, you know, on average they're a little bad. And so you say, here are the reasons why we are better, right? And so everyone can say that and 49% of them will be right. And you throw in some empire building and it's a, uh, people want to do stuff, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's, I, I think it's very similar to the active management story. Right? You want to do stuff, you see an active manager who seems smart, has a good rating, right? You like, you see a charismatic banker or charismatic corporate development guy or whatever, and you want to do some stuff. And then, uh, you can, you can persuade yourself that you're in the 49%. The Shad Johnson agreement, should the SEC and CFTC be independent agencies or should they be combined into one? I don't have a strong view on that. I, I mean, I don't see a compelling difference among them, but I also, you know, like if you combine them, there'd be departments for commodities and departments for equities. And, you know, like if you split off the SEC into like this, the equities and like the bond department tomorrow, like the, I'm not sure that I'm not sure what the institutional dynamics are that matter very much. I suspect that most of the time, the agencies are like roughly on board with each other in a sort of like broadly, like, like how much regulation should there be sort of perspective. Obviously there are times that there aren't right. Um, the CFTC fighting against derivatives in the, you know, early two thousands is a famous example of that. But I think sure. like in general, I'm not, I'm not sure like what the dynamics are where it matters that much one way or the other. Is American financial regulation too federalistic and too fragmented or not? You know, in my experience the existence of like state financial regulation was only like a weird footnote but i think in general it is almost certainly too federalistic and fragmented in the particular the example that was not core to my experience as a as a person in finance is insurance regulation is like very clearly too state-based and fragmented and gameable and i think that there are probably some securities cases that are that are similar but like the Insurance regulation is kind of the big one. And then, like, you could argue that corporate law should be federalized. Well, I don't think that there's a huge case for that just because, in practice, corporate law is a creature of Delaware. And so it's essentially, there's only one corporate law anyway. And what's the most overrated neighborhood in New York City? I don't know. <laughs> I don't pass. Why is William Gaddis an interesting writer? Why is William Gaddis an interesting writer? Because he's part of that, like, he's part of, like, the... I don't know. There's like a, there's like a period of like interesting modernist experimentation that sort of, I feel like the peak of it was like from like Joyce through like, you know, mid fifties or something. And I think Gaddis is the sort of like most contemporary, like weird writer, um, like weird kind of like mid century esoteric. Yeah. You know, I sometimes like to say, Matt Levine, only you can do what you do. So my final question is about what I call the Matt Levine production function. So, so many days in the week, early in the morning, typically, you have produced something that is perfectly clear and lucid and witty and informative and original. So many days over the course of a year, more than anyone else I know, spanning law, economics, finance, history, other things. So, there are many facets of your day and your work routines, but if you had to explain to someone, what is the Matt Levine production function? What is it you would draw our attention to? I think like a lot of people, a lot of it is panic. And I'm just sort of like, <laughs> you know, like I tell you, you know, I, um, 
I, at various points thought of being a law professor. I thought of being a classics professor and I never could write papers. Like I turned in my final paper in law school, like two weeks after graduation. And when I thought about leaving my job as a banker to become a blogger, my girlfriend, now wife was like, remember how you didn't write your papers in law school? Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, like what I think is like people have like the, their like proper metabolism for producing stuff. And like, for me, I wouldn't say it's easy. It's like incredibly difficult, but it is like reliable that I can produce something in a panic every day. Whereas if I think, I think if I had to produce something every week and I have some experience with this, if I have to produce something every week. I do it about every three weeks. So that's like one thing is just the, the sort of drive of panic. The other thing is like, I try to be pretty ruthlessly focused on places where I have an advantage or where I like can add value. And like, I try not like nice thing. One nice thing about working at Bloomberg is that there's like, like if I don't write about something, someone else will write about it. So I don't ever write about things because like someone needs to write about it. Right. Like if I write about it, it's cause I have something to say about it. And that I think is a rare and valuable flexibility to have. Like my beat is not, you know, I'm not like doing things because I have to do them. Those are, those are main things. I mean, the other, like, the other thing that I have is like, I worked on this weird derivatives desk at a bank where I was as an investment banker. So I covered corporate clients. And I went to meet with corporate clients with like coverage bankers who did M&A, but I was also selling them equity derivatives products, which were booked against our trading desk and where we were acting as a principal. And I was also underwriting convertible bonds. So I was seeing a lot of different sides of banks of the, of a bank and exposed to a lot of different like ways of being in finance, right? I mean, like the life of an investment banker is very different from the life of a vol trader. And I was sort of like, to some extent, bridging those lives, which was helpful. The other thing I was doing is I was explaining fairly complicated products to smart people who did not know anything about them. And so you'd go to a CFO and be like, what you want to do is an uncapped collared ASB with, you know, the variable maturity. And they'd be like, and then you'd have to explain to them not what the thing was because they don't care like what the set of legal documents are, but what the like economic intuitions behind it are. And so that like explaining economic intuitions to a smart person about a thing that is complicated is I think valuable in my current job. And the other thing that was valuable about that is that the economic intuitions I was explaining to the CFO were not necessarily the economic intuitions that we had. Like, we were doing the trade for something, for some exposure that we wanted or some set of payoffs that we got. And they were doing the trade for some other set of payoffs. And it wasn't like we were betting against them. It was like we had sort of two sort of overlapping set of interests in the trade. And so having some awareness of that is useful in sort of looking at complicated financial things that like different people can be getting something different and complicated out of a trade that that uh, that is not necessarily described in the in the public documents for that trade. Matt Levine, only you can do what you do. And thank you for the conversation. We now do have some time for questions. I will call on you. A mic will come to you. Please note these are questions, not speeches. The goal is to hear from Matt Levine. I will cut you off if need be. So questions for Matt. There's one right here. Thanks a lot. Uh, I just had it on the topic of efficient markets and crypto assets. Uh, I wonder if you think it's uh, possible that the prices of many of these assets are far too high now, and if that might be because the risks of buying and the risks of selling are very different, and whether, in particular, whether there's other assets like, say, binary options or something that might result in more accurate lower prices. I'll preface by saying, in general, I'm an efficient markets believer. Like, I never want to be like, oh, these cryptos are too highly valued and they're all going to crash to zero because, you know, what do I know? That said, do I think that there are some, let's say, technical reasons that a lot of crypto assets are too highly valued? Like, I do think that there are like some obvious limits to arbitrage. One is that there is a perception that it's hard to short a lot of crypto assets. Some people tell me that's not true and you can, oh, you can borrow Bitcoin, no problem. But like there is a perception that it's hard to short them. Even if it's like easy to borrow them, you have like you know, it's always more dangerous to short something super volatile than to, to be long something super volatile. The other thing that like, I don't really understand about Bitcoin is like exchange withdrawal limits that make it 
seem like there are a lot of places where you can buy Bitcoin and then not sell it, never mind shorting, but like where it is very easy to put as much money as you want into an exchange to buy as many Bitcoins as you want. But selling those Bitcoins and taking your cash out is a more complicated and lengthier process. I don't know if that's true at all exchanges, but it's clearly true at some exchanges. So yeah, I mean, I think there are some technical factors that probably lead to Bitcoin overvaluation. Can technical things solve that? Maybe. I mean, like the futures, the spread between futures and cash has converged, which suggests that there is some, there is some like price discovery going on in the futures market, and maybe it is being helpful in Bitcoin. I've never heard an argument that binary options make pricing more efficient in any asset class, but who knows? Next question is here in the front, if you could bring the mic. Uh, my question for you, Matt, is how do you avoid writing on political topics when it feels like that's what the whole rest of the world is talking about? Or does an editor just kind of strike the paragraphs right before oh, posting? Uh, no, quite the opposite. My God. Um, sometimes I strike the paragraphs right before posting, but not often. I don't know. I think it's actually pretty easy to avoid writing what everyone else is writing about. As I said to Tyler, like you know, my interest is in places where I have an advantage. And it seems to me that even if I write a really good take on Trump, it will only be the 50th best take on Trump of the 12,000 written that morning. Whereas, you know, if I write about Kodak coin, I'll be only one of 20 people writing about Kodak. <laughs> if I write about, you know, gaming of FERC regulations, I might be alone, right? So like, there, you know, like you don't want to, you don't want to only write about total esoterica, but I think it's really easy to figure that people are fill up on, on Trump news and want something else. And I think that's empirically true because people, when I do like occasionally write about political news, people email me like, man, your newsletter is such a nice relief from political news. I'm so mad that you wrote about Trump today. So. Front row, there's a question. We're in Midtown where there's an extreme clustering of the finance industry, an industry where rarely do we actually need to meet each other. Do you think that will grow, continue, decay? I guess it'll decay. I think that like, I worked in as, a, as an investment banker and like, there is something in high dollar sales about people really believe in in-person meetings. And I experienced it where I'd like go to a meeting where like a colleague would dial in and you could tell how much better my experience was in the room than her experience was on the phone. So I think that like, yeah, on the one hand, like to the extent that like if trading consists of computers trading with each other, it does seem somewhat unnecessary that we all sit within 10 blocks of each other. On the other hand, to the extent that finance is like the business of M&A and of like very high dollar sales businesses, I'm not sure that it's as, as amenable to fragmentation as you might think. Three rows back, this question in the middle. Apologies for another crypto question, but uh, to me, the fact that Bitcoin took off, some would say because it has a fixed supply, has made me question even how much uh, low and stable inflation has political costs. So my question would be, how has the rise of crypto changed your mind about some of your beliefs around finance and economics? It's hard. I mean, like in some ways, like, you know, so, so I think it is probably, you know, at the margin weakened my general view of myself as an efficient market fundamentalist, right? I mean, it just feels so weird. It feels so weird and it feels so like, you know, when you say that you believe in efficient markets, like one aspect of that is believing in like, you know, that markets incorporate fundamental information in some way, right? That's whatever Bitcoin is doing. It's not that, right? So it is just, it is just, it's just weird on that basis. Beyond that, I, I don't know. I mean, like, this is not a good answer, but like, I'm used to believing in a financial system, right? Where it's not just like a series of like actors, but like where there is a sort of like sociological set of connections between like the banks do this and the prime brokers do this and the hedge funds do this and like the retail investors do that. And there's like this very sort of structured system and Bitcoin really is just spike that, that kind of is totally unrelated to that system. And that has nonetheless had pretty big impact and also like had pretty big impact on that system where like all the actors in that system are recalibrating themselves. So that's just like a weird, like, you know, I wouldn't have guessed that, X Bitcoin, if you had said, can some fintech new entrant disrupt banking or whatever, I'd have been like, eh, it's like really hard. There are a lot of like relationships already. And Bitcoin is like a pretty good argument that like something big can disrupt the financial system. Next question. Yes, here. Thank you. If, uh, if we were to look at the most frequent words used on this stage, I'm guessing that weird would be probably one of the most popular. So what's your framework for deciding whether something is weird? 
I don't know that I have one. I mean, it's just like sort of like if it matches with my sort of prior intuitions. I mean, it's it's I like weird. So so when I use weird, it's it's often just a sort of synonym for interesting. And it's just like my own. I wouldn't say I have a framework. What I would say is that like whatever sort of set of biases I have to find things interesting and weird and funny and quirky, I just write about it. And like that seems to have resonated with some audience. But like I'm not sure that I can articulate what that framework is. Next question. Hi, uh, what's a rule that should be amended or repealed? I should always be prepared for these things. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like, I'm going to give a weird one, which is, um, this is not an answer to your question. But I've been <laughs> thinking a lot recently about Regulation FD, which is the rule that says that companies can't disclose material non-public information to one investor unless they've simultaneously disclosed it to all of their investors. Which seems like a very straightforward fairness rule. And which is like the weird aspect of it is that the weird aspect of it is that um, companies meet constantly with their investors and their investors are very excited to meet with them and like want research analysts to set up these meetings. Like there's a whole economy of these meetings and yet they're never disclosing material non-public information. And then the investors leave those meetings and go trade. And it's like, well, they didn't learn anything in those meetings. It's just a, it's a striking set of facts. And what I think is striking about it is that it's clearly how the world should work, that companies should talk to the people who own them. And those people should be able to like ask questions and propose, you know, and say, hey, you should really be doing this. And then watch the executives reactions. And yet at the same time, like the law says you can't do it. So I don't know how I would amend it. But I think that there is a tension between the existence of this rule that on its face you would think would prohibit substantive meetings between companies and their investors and like the lived practice of finance in which companies meet with their investors and have investor relations departments and are owned by those investors and have fiduciary duties to those investors. It would be strange if they never met with them. But it's also strange that they do meet with them because this law, this rule exists that that you would think would, uh, would cast a shadow on those meetings. Next question. You write pretty frequently on information security and hacks. Are we as worried as we should be about that? And non sequitur, have we reached peak beard? I was, I was noticing when we were backstage that Shipley and we both have beards. I, I guess we're at, I'm at, my, my beard is cyclical. I, I, my beard <laughs> runs from like end of December through like spring. <laughs> I suppose we're at the peak of my own beard cycle. <laughs> I actually, I have no expertise in information security. It seems overwhelmingly likely to me that we're not worried enough about hacks because when I I occasionally read people who are experts, they're like, the world will end and you will die horribly because you don't change your password. And (laughs) they're probably telling the truth and I don't change my password. So I'm certain that the answer to your question is we're not sufficiently worried about hacks. I mean, you know, there was a, there was a story that I just like saw the headline that someone conducted a successful jackpot attack on a U.S. ATM, which means that you do the thing where you like somehow get the ATM to give you all of the money that was in the ATM. And that seems like a good hack. And, uh, <laughs> and like, I, you know, I always read about bank hacks and they're like, well, they had this bank and like they got some email addresses and now they're sending them spam. And I'm like, that doesn't seem like a very good hack. But, um, but, you know, in some time frame, like they'll get the money, right? And then that'll be really bad, right? Like not just because like they'll take money from a bank, but that like, you know, like our whole world exists on like a series of computers. And like if you hack one of those ro- those computers that is like central to like the world and our identity and our financial lives, then like this is really bad. And like, you know, they're still in the, the, the email addresses, right? They're hacking the ATMs. Like, well, they, I, don't know. I don't know. Last question. In Democracy in America, in America, Tocqueville called lawyers America's priests of Egypt because both professions are the only interpreters of an occult science, which I take to mean sort of uh, that they're both responsible for explaining enough of their systems that people retain their faith in them, but not so much that people lose their faith or they put themselves out of a job. I'm wondering if you could put that same mantle on financiers or on financial journalists, and if you think the sector as a whole has achieved sort of an efficient sweet spot in the extent which it's understood, its mysteries are understood by the American public. Softball question. <laughs> that. You know, I think that like, like, sure. I, yeah. But like, I think that's true of a lot of sectors actually. Right. I mean, I think we just like live in a specialized economy, right. Where like, if you ask like our, our financiers, like a priesthood because they explain like just enough to like maintain a mystery, like, yeah, but like Facebook way more so. Right. Like, I mean, I think that like 
we live in a specialized economy and everyone is sort of angling for that notion that what they do is complicated and mysterious and important and you can sort of get a glimpse of it but like i need to maintain the secrets i do think finance is like you know high up in the sweet spot where like people think it's very complicated and and they need to they need to like defer to a priesthood but i also think that like finance has like come down a bit where now like people think ah it's complicated we need to ban it or ah it's complicated and we need to need to radically simplify and get rid of leverage rules and you know like or like you know add le- simplified leverage rules and all these things that are that are that suggests that like the general public does not believe the mystique. They find it confusing, but not in a, not in an awe inspiring way. It's Matt, true of lawyers too. Matt Levine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Two announcements. First, you all should subscribe to conversations with Tyler. There are also chats with Malcolm Gladwell, Steven Pinker, Cliff Asnes, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Martina Navratilova to come, David Brooks to come. And thank you all again. And Matt, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Tyler. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.